Hi, this is Rick. I've been working on a new version of Ross Sandstorm, which is now version 3.5. The first new feature, which is uh, something that a number of people have asked for. And I know Liberation, a lot of guys running Liberation servers will probably find this very useful. I know some of the Liberation servers are using it already. Um, but this is a, a far better and improved version of that uh, custom script that I wrote for them. Um, so this is a, the first new feature is a randomized sandstorm scheduler. It takes into account the time multiplier that's been set in mission, where sometimes a, a mission will, particularly liberation servers, have a longer day cycle and a shorter night cycle, so they're using a time multiplier. Um, so the storm takes that into account and, and uh, obviously resets the time multiplier back to the original settings once the storm is complete. Um, it also takes into account the server restarts. So what it does is it calculates the number of required sandstorms based on the number of hours left in the day, randomizes the position of the sandstorms and schedules them to start automatically uh, on the server. Um, and obviously it also allows you to, to choose a different uh, sandstorm length and so on. Uh, then there's an inside vehicle check, an inside building check for sound attenuation. It also now checks to see whether, if you're in a, in a building, whether you close the door or not. And if you close the door, it works on almost all buildings, you'll hear the sound attenuate, uh, which gives you a greater sense of real, realism, which is nice. Um, then it also now checks to see whether you're wearing eye protection. And if you're wearing goggles, then uh, your eyes won't get hurt and you won't um, get hurt, obviously, and uh, you won't make the associated hurt sounds. If you're not wearing eye protection, then uh, your eyes will get slightly damaged and um, you'll be told to put on some protective eyewear and uh, you'll hear the guy grunting and generally getting hurt and he takes a small amount of physical damage over time. Uh, insufficient to kill him, but enough to hurt him over a period of five minutes. The next feature is a um, random chance that your hat will blow off. Obviously you've got to be wearing the right or suitable headwear, but if you're wearing like a bandana or a floppy hat or a boonie hat or something like that, there's a good chance that your hat it might blow off. Uh, you can then run after your hat, pick it up and put it back on again, which is kind of cool. Um, and then I've improved the intra outro uh, fade in, fade out effects on the sandstorm. I'm going to show you how the new storm works and then I'm going to be using this script which is a uh, rust start sandstorm. You can uh, simply call it using this line, number of sandstorms, the length of the sandstorm and, uh, and, it, and it will automatically run the sandstorm approximately at some random time between now and 2400 hours. The minimum sandstorm length being calculated on the basis of 150 seconds is the minimum time, plus uh, increment of 55, which is the main loop time for the sound, wind sound. So 55 times N plus 150 will give you your sound length. So if you want a sandstorm to run for 480 seconds or 150 is the minimum. So you would specify that in the startup lines. So that's extremely easy to use. Um, you would put this line into your init.sql file. You can also use the sandstorm on its own if you want to schedule a specific time for a sandstorm to start. And, that is, and then you would use it in this way. You would simply just call the sandstorm script itself and not use the start sandstorm, which is, as I said, the randomizer. To call the start sandstorm script, Typically, you would put this into your init.sql file and you would put these three lines into, your, into that file. It simply declares a public variable saying that the sandstorm currently is not running. Uh, the number of sandstorms you want, the minimum length of the sandstorm, and that line. And that's all you need to put into your, uh, into your init.sql file. And then what the scheduler will do is it will run four sandstorms between now and 2400. It will also modify the number of sandstorms, assuming that, let's say, you had to restart the, the server at, let's say, 10 o'clock at night. There's only two hours left in the day, and when you restart the server, it's going to see, oh, you want to schedule four sandstorms between now and midnight, which is a little unrealistic. So it will downscale the number of uh, 
scheduled uh, sandstorms based on the, the minimum uh, realistic uh, interval or interleave between sandstorms. Um, included in the mission file, which I'll put into a Dropbox link, is this init.sqf file, uh, which basically allows you to adjust the length of the day and night cycle using a, a time multiplier. So in this case, uh, if you want uh, your day to be four and your night to be two hours long, then you can just change these two or just change these numbers according to your specific needs. If you don't need to use this, obviously just remove it and just put this that little bit into your init.sqf file. All right, so let me show you what it looks like and then I'll get into the actual scripts themselves. But before I do that, I just want to point out a few things. When it calculates an attenuate sound based on your uh, on whether you're in a building or in a vehicle, uh, it does that by calculating using the bounding box in the case of buildings. Obviously, it, it, when you're in a car, that's easy, or a vehicle, it's easy for it to, to, to detect whether the vehicle player equals the player or doesn't. If the vehicle player doesn't equal the player, then you're obviously in a vehicle. Um, so, in this case, we've got, uh, I've placed down this airport uh, controls tower in Eden. Uh, this is obviously a map uh, object or terrain object. Uh, if you look at the bounding box of this building, you can see that it's considerably larger than the actual uh, building itself. Um, the reason for that is that, well, in some instances it's actually not calculated correctly so here you have the bounding box which is actually correct this side because the widest point is obviously this roof area and so at the bottom the bounding box will be obviously wider than the base but on this side you can see there's a considerable extension uh, and i think the reason for that is that they probably maybe if you could extend this model up which you can do okay so there goes my theory um, I thought maybe there was some stairs or something in this had a, a wider base originally and maybe they trimmed it off and left the bounding box the same size. Anyway, the net result of this whole thing is that if you, uh, let me just transform this snap to terrain. If you, in order for you to calculate the position inside this building, what it does is it uses the a bounding box the minimum position and the maximum position, X, Y, and Z coordinates. Basically, it looks at the bounding box lower this corner here, picks up the X, Y, Z coordinate, and then it looks at the X, Y, Z coordinate. I don't know if you can see these thin yellow lines here on the bounding box, and it uses that as the max point. Now, if you're inside this box, then your values will be greater than that point and less than that point. So essentially, says yeah you're inside the box the problem with that is that if you're standing there you are being calculated as being inside this this building and in reality you're not so in order to kind of get around that because other than either either i'd have to create a database of every single building and the offsets for the bounding box and correct for that uh that that's uh Apart from the overall amount of work involved, uh, it will also create an, an overhead as far as processing is concerned, and that would under basically not be worth it. So what I've done to work around that problem is, since you obviously are going to run into the building, when you get within a certain distance, uh, it waits for a 0.5 of a second for you to kind of get close enough to the building for the sound to attenuate, and so that kind of gives you the, a realistic effect even though you're not maybe actually in the building. In this particular case, maybe you're standing on the doorway, but you are sheltered by this concrete, and that sort of reduces the volume. When you go in the building and you close the door, that also reduces the volume. Very complicated to do that, and it's not 100% reliable, but uh, it works in most cases. Okay, before I show the new Sandstorm effects off, just want to mention that if you're wearing a hard hat or uh, any type of helmet, ear protectors or a headset, uh, you've got zero chance of them being blown off during uh, or shimag 
uh, during a sandstorm. If you um, are wearing a hat, bandana, beanie, bandage, beret, or a cap, or a boonie hat, six, there's a 60% chance it'll be blown off. Another thing, uh, if you're wearing eyewear, protective eyepieces, then you'll notice that there's less film grain and you won't get hurt and uh, you won't hear him grunting and taking pain. If you take your glasses off where you don't have protective eyewear, you need to get in a building. Um, otherwise you'll, you'll hear him grunting and taking pain and there'll be a higher level of film grain on the screen. Alright, so I'm going to start it up. I can't uh, talk while the sandstorm's on because it's a bit loud, so I'll see you just now. Okay, so now we're going to look at the scripts. All right, so as mentioned, there are two ways to start this. Uh, one is to use the Sandstorm scheduler, which is good for listen servers, dedicated servers, and so on. And, e and even if you want to just schedule one Sandstorm randomly during your mission, it, it will work in single player, multiplayer, and so on. 
in which case you would just simply change the first number and then uh, choose a, du a duration of the sandstorm that, that seems realistic to you. Um, if you want to specify exactly when the sandstorm is going to happen, well then, as I mentioned in the beginning, you just simply uh, run this line, maybe run it through a trigger or some event in your game where you want to have a sandstorm. Just choose the duration of the sandstorm and run this and uh, a sandstorm will happen immediately. Uh, just going through the scheduler, the start sandstorm uh, scheduler. Um, this is uh, only run on the server or the machine that the person is playing on. In other words, the listen server. Um, picks up the number of sandstorms through the select zero. Uh, picks up the sandstorm length from the select one. This creates an empty array, checks the current daytime, stores it in a local variable. Uh, looks at the number of hours left in the day, which is 24 minus the current time. And it gets the, uh, the the length of the storm, plus it adds a, um, a five minute overhead so that it can't schedule a storm up to uh, the last five minutes before midnight, uh, allowing for the length of this, the sandstorm, simply because uh, it's a safety precaution to ensure that the um, that the sandstorm doesn't span the 2400 to 0 100 hour uh, restart server restart time. Uh, then it looks at the amount of time left, hours in the day minus the storm, uh, the length of the storm in hours. Um, and then it, um, the minimum time per sandstorm is, an, is one sandstorm per two hours. So as I said earlier, if we were, if it, if it was, let's say the server was uh, restarted at 10 o'clock and you only had two hours before midnight, it will only schedule one, sh one sandstorm, even if you, sh you specifically have four sandstorms set as the default for in, within a 24-hour period. Um, okay, then I'm not going to go through all of the process, but um, if there's anything specific that I can mention here. There's some comments that I need to remove. And this is the bit that does the scheduling. It has a look at the number of sandstorms. It says, okay, we're going to be running, uh, let's say, four sandstorms. It gets the daytime, which it takes to four decimal places. And then the way it, it traps the, the actual time that the sandstorm sh is scheduled, the way it picks that up is by looking at the current start time and make sure that the daytime and the daytime is less than the start time plus and it gives a little adds a little bit extra time just so that there's a if the server is busy it can actually trap trap the the specific time otherwise you you're looking at like a fractional amount of, of a second uh, if it misses that then the sandstorm won't happen so i found that was probably the best method and then get remote execs across the network to all of the players it passes the sandstorm length runs the sandstorm, sends it across the network to all the, the, the machines. Uh, then the sandstorm itself, or sandstorm, uh, debug is switched off. So if you want to see exactly what's happening while the sandstorm's running, you can change that to true. Um, it uses, uh, for JIP purposes, it uses a uh, sandstorm running equals true, public variable sandstorm, so that if someone joined in progress, uh, this variable will be sent to their machine from the server. If the sandstorm is already running, it's not going to run a second time uh, on the machine. Uh, it sets a few variables, like inside, which is a, a, a global variable, door closed, nearest door, and so on. Calculating nearest door is a really tricky process, and it's not 100% reliable, but uh, especially in some, some buildings where you have multiple doors and you could have multiple people come in different doors, it gets a bit uh, complicated. But I haven't really bothered to try and resolve that because it creates too much of a processing overhead and that defeats the whole point. Uh, and it's not critical. I mean, uh, there's a certain amount of attenuation uh, with the sound effect that I'm using so that you get these highs and lows and so the volume does, it, does adapt in any event, so that sort of cushions and covers some of the errors in some of the buildings.
uh, where the door or the detection of the door being open and closed is not 100% reliable. Uh, it stores the current time multiplier and resets it at the end, by the way, which I think I mentioned. Um, plays a sandstorm warning. Then uh, starts the intro sound. Increases the wind to 15 kilometers an hour in a north northerly direction and a north and an easterly direction. Um, I'm lucky vector. And then uh, it checks to see if the player is wearing goggles. And if he's not wearing goggles, it tells him to put some on. Starts the leaves. Starts the main wind loop by running a separate script, which is this script here. Passes end time and debug to it. It sleeps for 12 and a half seconds before it starts and fades in using the speech channel. So I can fade sound. Runs it in a non-scheduled environment while time is less than end time. Plays a sound wind loop and then it sleeps for 59 seconds. The actual sound is is actually a minute long, uh, like an extra second just to just to bridge it in case there's a slight delay. And then after this completes, uh, it then runs the outro loop. Then we're back to the sandstorm. Then it starts the film grain. Commits the film grain of zero point. I've actually adjusted it slightly from what you just saw in the video. Made it fractionally less. The default is now 0 .0, 0 0.08. Um, video compression also does affect the way the grain looks. Uh, it's not quite as extreme as you saw it in the video. So then there's actually a 60% chance of your hat blowing off. And that runs a Ross hat blows off script, which I'll go into now. Um, okay, so let's check to see if the, the machine has a player playing on it and that the person uh, isn't in a vehicle. If he is, then it's not a really a good idea to have your hat blow off while you're driving a vehicle unless the roof, you don't have a roof on the car. But in this case, I decided it doesn't matter what car you're driving, your hat's not going to blow off. This debug can be off. Uh, okay, it sleeps for 10 seconds. There's some constants that I set. Uh, the distance currently will vary. Sometimes the trigger before it drops on the ground will be 35 meters. Other times it'll be 20 meters. So it's between 20 and 35 meters. The animate distance, uh, I'm not using it at the moment. Um, I was planning on doing it so that when you walked up to the hat, it started moving away from you. And so I thought that was quite funny, but then I decided against that. Um, cause it's kind of complicated stuff to do this. Uh, you can't just like spawn a hat on the floor and kind of move it using some attached object or something. Well, you can, but it's a little bit more complicated than that too. Cause we want to be able to pick it up and put it on our head. So you have to, you have to create a, a thing called a, uh, a weapon holder. In this case, I'm using a, not using a ground weapon holder, although I do later on. I use a weapon holder, a simulated weapon holder. So that thing uh, has some physics. Um, right, so then it creates some um, yaw pitch and roll settings. I use the direction of the unit for the yaw function. Just gets the headgear from the unit checks to see if he's wearing a helmet uh, so, and if he's wearing a helmet or a she mag or a construction helmet then this uh, then these variables will be ret will return true if they do return true if, you, if debugs on sends a message wearing uh, unsuitable headgear and it exits the script and if he's not wearing a hat well there's no point in continuing the script so it exits um, then it checks to see if the wind's strong enough and it picks up the wind speed. It converts the, uh, the wind vector. Remember it was 15 north, 15 east. So it just converts that by adding the um, squared values of X and Y and then taking a square root for the wind to convert to a wind speed. Then um, it says if wind speed's less than 14, then the wind's too slow. Then it exits. And then the chances of the hat blowing off is uh, just a random, chooses a ran random, puts it in a local variable, random one. So zero to, to one 
if uh, the probability is less than or equal to 0 0.4, then it, it sends a prompt to the screen saying the probability is uh, is 40 is whatever it is, less than 40 percent, and uh, it then exits the script. If he's inside a building or a car, it debugs on, then it sends a message and it exits. Because uh, you don't want your hat blowing off in the house or in the building or in the car, as I mentioned. Next, it uh, gets the initial position of the unit and it uh, adds a little bit to the X, Y, and Z and quite a bit to the Z position. Um, creates a weapon ho holder simulated at the initial position, uh, sets the vector direction up so it looks like it's the same position that it would be on your head. Uh, it then adds uh, the new hat into the uh, weapon holder, uh, switches off the simulation of the weapon holder, and hides it. In, um, then it unhides it. These are all very time sensitive things. It removes the headgear of the unit and then unhides the weapon holder. So it looks like the hat's back on your head, just briefly. Then. Um, it gets the position again of the uh, of the unit. Uh, sets an increment to zero, and then it uh, is while the weapon holder exists, and it hasn't touched down on the ground. Uh, sets a scope name to loop one. So this here is loop one. It creates a gets a two D position of the initial position using get pose. So it gets the current position based on the increment and the direction. Then uh, the weapon holder, it places it at the current position. Now the tricky part here is that you need the hat to, I need to be able to bring the hat down to the ground. And that was a really terrific, difficult thing because I was moving from a 2D, uh, a 2D position to a 3D position. So I take the initial pose, and that's why I use initial pose and select two on that. And then I have to trim off a bit of a bit of a bit of the height so that the when you see the hat move, it starts off at his head height rather than down by his feet, because it kind of defeats the point. And the your pitch and roll setting. Um, then it does a, a set vector direction and up. It rotates the hat. And then I've got to stop the hat when it's because you're running after it. It calculates the distance between the weapon holder and the unit. And if it's greater than or equal to the distance, then touchdown is true. So I can break out the break out of this loop here. Because touchdown, not not touchdown, so it kills that. And then it switches the simulation on of the weapon holder. Now that it starts dropping to the ground. And then it breaks out of the scope which it would probably do in any event because uh, it's just like a double check. Um, it's all very time sensitive. And the hat falls to the floor. So then it tries to get the position of the vertical position of the weapon holder. It's very difficult because when it falls to the floor, it kind of falls really fast. And for some reason, it's difficult to get the actual physical position of it. But I can trap it, trap some information by looking at uh, it's also it goes below the ground because what I wanted to do because I, I I couldn't stop it on the ground level, so what happens is it falls through the floor, so that's a kind of a problem, because then it just disappears and you can't go and pick the hat up. So I thought well maybe there's a way of getting around that. I'll let it fall through the floor, um, and then I'll delete it, but when it goes through the floor, I'll try and grab its current position, and then I'll create a new weapon holder with a ground weapon holder at the position that it transfers through the ground. So that when you run over to it, you can see, oh, there's your hat lying on the floor. It's actually not your hat. It's a new hat that's been generated. So you, each time you run after your hat, you get a new hat, which is really exciting. Okay, so now that's the, um, so that's how the hat blowing off bit works. Next thing is you need to uh, check to see if he's wearing eye protection. And if he is, uh, if he isn't, he's going to get hurt. So it runs another script called Ross Hurt. 
Cross hit is a nice short little script. There's an array of sounds. It uh, says while time is less than end time, in other words, while the sandstorm is still running and it hasn't gone into the fade out phase. If the goggles the player's wearing don't exist, in other words, he's not wearing goggles and he's not inside and uh, hurt on hasn't started, in other words, it's not, not getting hurt. Because this is in a while loop, I'm going to pause it for a while. I want him to grant periodically so it sort of sounds more realistic. Film grain was passed to the script so I can then adjust the film grain. Uh, so in this case, I'll adjust the film grain to 0 0.011 because he's not wearing any glasses. And then he grunts, he says, player say 3D. So you don't need to send this across the network because the player himself is going to actually grunt. He'll hear himself grunting. And uh, it sleeps for up to 10 seconds minimum of five seconds gets the damage of the player every seven and a half seconds approximately is going to damage you by 0 0.02 um, depending on the length of the sandstorm I mean, you could end up like being really damaged by the end of it but the probability is you're going to get some glasses and or go inside a building or whatever if you go inside a building the damage stops so because then inside equals true then this piece will discontinue and this bit will happen you're either in the house, you're wearing glasses, then set the film gram to back to zero or back to the, the default, which was 0 0.08. And then it just keeps doing that until the end time is, is completed. So then we get into the, the, main, the main loop. And this is the loop that calculates, this is the loop down to here. And it builds an array of doors, because now we're going to work out if the guy's inside a house, how do we attenuate sound and so on. And, uh, and finds the nearest object, which is the building, closest to, uh, to the player, uh, gets a relative position of the player. It gets a bounding box uh, reel for the building. And then it calculates the minimum and maximum values for the bounding box and the relative position of the player x y and z position of the player so now we've got all the basic information we need in order to determine whether the player is in the bounding box of the building so uh, if the if the vehicle player is not equal to player in other words he's in a vehicle then inside is true because he's inside and we'll fade speech uh, to 0 0.4 switch the cam shake off then if the vehicle player is the player and the player's x value is less is greater than the minimum x and so on and so on and so on then he's inside and then enable the cam shake uh, to false so in other words he's in the building otherwise he's not in the building and then switch on cam shake and add uh, a certain amount of cam shake which is the shake power shake rattle and roll i think we had that at the top of the because one of the, some of the variables that i said earlier right up here yeah shake power duration blah 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 so then so then it completes that and remember this is all in a while loop so this is happening constantly it sleeps for half a second then it says okay well you if you're inside and the vehicle player equals player in other words you're not in a you're not in a car then half the output volume on the play sound radio channel and then they will switch off the cam shake and then it checks to see if there's a door and so it uses the building animation phase uh, x for each door it checks it checks the entire array of doors and finds one door in that entire array where the animation phase is greater than 0 0.02 this is where the problem comes in when you have multiple people running into the same building if they're going through the same door that's fine if they're going through different doors that can get a bit tricky but since this is running on each client it still does work mostly um okay so if building animation phase greater than 0 0.2 then in other words the uh if then the door is open so now we know which door which door we're dealing with so nearest door is now equal to x because we found a door that's been opened next thing is uh sleeps for half a second and then it says uh checks to see if the door is being closed because we now know that the door that we're dealing with is nearest door because that was the door that we discovered in that array within the building that the unit is in 
and that door had an animation phase. So we now know of greater than 0.2. So we know which door, that there's a door that's been opened. We assume it's the door next to him. And then uh, we know that if, it, if the animation phase is less than 0 0.2, then the door's been closed. Then we can set that variable to true, and we can fade the, the volume even further. Otherwise, the door close equals false, and put the volume back to, to default indoor sound. In other words, uh, it's running at half the normal volume. See for half a second. Otherwise, inside equal in, if these are all conditions are wrong or false, then, then it can't be inside. In other words, put the volume back to normal, then uh, set the variable door close to false because it obviously has gone outside, so you kind of walk through the wall of the door. Enable camshake, switch it on again, uh, and add, add the camshake back to where it was, and it keeps doing that. Then it starts the fog. Now this is all happening in a spawned environment, so this is unscheduled, so this is happening in the background while this, the rest of the script continues to run. So it's the fog, adds color correction, uh, adds a particle effect, the uh, uh, biz, biz funks uh, sandstorm, which creates a little uh, low impact uh, particle effect. Um, then it modifies the color correction. It then starts to fade out. It uh, fades out the color correction, fades out, removes the fog, um, it removes the particles removes all particles, reduces the wind progressively over a period of uh, 15, uh, 15 seconds. It then removes the film grain. It sets the wind to the original wind setting. It resets some of the uh, variables, switches off camshake, sets for 15 seconds, removes all the leaves, removes the color correction, Resets a time multiplier back to the generic time multiplier that the mission uh, was that that the mission was set to uh, up front. Then sets the public variable to false. Now the storm is finished, and that's the end of the sandstorm. So basically, that's how it works. And hope you enjoy it. And if there's any comments, please uh, let me know. Thanks a lot. Cheers.